Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 31st Annual High-Risk Emergency Medicine course. Our topic right now is going to be on pulmonary emboli. My name is Roya Kaloya. I rhyme. I'm also the Associate Director of Clinical Education at USACS, and I am an ER physician. I'm excited to talk to you guys about pulmonary embolism. I'm probably as excited as you guys are uh, to hear about pulmonary embolism. You probably think, I don't want to hear about pulmonary emboli anymore. I think about it all the time, or I'm worried I'm going to miss it all the time, or all my residents think they're going to miss it all the time, or whatever it is. Um, I think we hear so much about pulmonary emboli, but despite how much we hear about it, we are still missing it, if you can believe it. And the biggest risk that we have is that we're failing to even consider it in patients. And so what what can we do? And that's what I want to help you with, is what can we do to be better and not miss it in our patients and to consider it in them? If this isn't the person that came in red to Nelly and has the large leg and is short of breath. Those patients we all get, right? You don't need any help with figuring out whether they have a pulmonary embolism or don't. It's the patient that comes in, maybe has some comorbidities, maybe they have CHF, maybe they have coronary artery disease, and they have maybe a little bit of chest pain, or maybe their symptoms are even more vague than that, and their symptoms are just some shortness of breath, maybe some lightheadedness, maybe just fatigue, how can we do better to identify these patients uh, when they come into our emergency department? I want, by the end of this, for you to hear my voice in the back of your head when you see these patients and think, are you a pulmonary embolism? And I want you to always think that about with certain patients, not everyone, not the ankle sprain, not the toe pain, but the right patients, I want you to think about it and I want you to not miss it. Biggest take homes, I want you to use your clinical judgment plus. So your clinical judgment is paramount, but we also have tools. We're the MacGyvers of medicine. So we want to use the tools that we have at our disposal. Use your ultrasound, use your wells, use your D-dimers, use your perk, but use them appropriately. I'm going to teach you how to use your clinical judgment first, and then also make sure that you're not missing out on using the tools that are available to us to help us treat our patients better. When you have a patient that comes in with cough, dyspnea, and chest pain, I want you to think PE. I want it to be second nature. I want you to walk into that room, and I want you to say, prove to me you're not a pulmonary embolism. And then lastly, and this is going to seem silly, I want you to remember your physical exam. It's important. We forget about it sometimes, um, and it can make all of the difference in the world. So clinical judgment plus. First, use it. Obviously, you are, it doesn't matter whether you're five months out or you're 15 years out, you have some clinical judgment that you have developed, so use your clinical judgment and don't be worried about using it. In the same vein, if you've been out five months or 15 years, we can always use some extra help with our clinical judgment. There are times we're tired. There are times where we've seen the patient six times in a row. There are times where we have our biases. So sometimes in those situations, it's helpful to have another tool to kind of check uh, our own selves. First thing we're going to talk about is the pulmonary embolism rule out criteria. So PERC is what it's known as. Um, It'll, if you may not have even thought about what it stands for. It's pulmonary embolism rule out criteria. So you're not using this to rule in pulmonary emboli. These are the patients you don't think have pulmonary embolism, so you want to rule them out. Wells is also a risk stratification tool. This is usually where you're going to want to get started um, when you try to think about your patients and do they have a pulmonary embolism, do they not? In order to use any of these tools, you have to have the thought in your mind somewhere that th could this be a pulmonary embolism? Could it not be a pulmonary embolism? And then you go through the tools to help you decide, do you need to do a D-dimer? Do you need to just send the patient home? Do you need to do a CTI? D-dimer. Um, I have a love-hate relationship with D-dimer. You may also have a love-hate relationship with the D-dimer, but I want to have I want to teach you how to love it more than hate it. And I think one of the biggest issues with the D-dimer is that we don't use it the right way. And I think if we do do a little bit of tweaking here and there and we use the test the way it's intended to be used, then we can have more success with it and feel less like we're just rolling the dice. Um, and then lastly, with your clinical judgment, we touched on it a little bit already. I want, if nothing else, I want you to not anchor. Uh, we are all guilty of it. If we have this chest pain, shortness of breath, the patient had a coronary artery disease, 
on STEMI all day long, put them in, someone else will figure it out. Um, I want you to think that extra step. I want you to take those extra steps and really see, is this a pulmonary embolism? Isn't it a pulmonary embolism? And if you don't think it, you will never rule it in or out. So I want to make sure that you're always thinking it. So first, Wells, um, there's a few things on there and each one is different scores and the interpretation of Wells is different. Um, so let's say, if we're, there are different ways of doing it. So clinical signs and symptoms of DVT is three points. Pulmonary embolism is your number one diagnosis or equally likely is three points. This allows for your subjective clinical judgment to play a role in the next steps that you take. Heart rate greater than 100 is one and a half points. Immobilization three days of surgery in the past four weeks is one and a half points. Previous DVT or pulmonary embolism is one and a half points. Hemoptysis and cancer with treatment within the past six months or palliative care are each one point. There's different um, ways of interpreting the data. Uh, there are two schools of thought. You could do three tiers or you could do two tiers. If you do three tiers, then there's a less than two consider doing a D-dimer on the patient or sending the patient home. Uh, two to six, uh, consider doing the D-dimer, and then greater than six, just go to the uh, getting the CAT scan. The other school of thought is to do the two tiers, and ASAP is actually more behind doing two tiers. So less than four, PE, unlikely, uh, do a D-dimer. If D-dimer is negative, patient goes home greater than four points, then you go ahead and do the CAT scan to rule out the pulmonary embolism, which makes sense, right? So if PE is your number one diagnosis, that's three points, and their heart rate is greater than 100, and they've had hemoptysis, why wouldn't you do a CAT scan on this patient to rule out a pulmonary embolism, right? It makes sense. So the other school of thought is you do wells, and if they have a low wells, you don't even have to go, so if that, that the three-tier model, if they're less than two, you could go to PERC um, instead of going straight to the D-dimer. And PERC, like we talked about before, is the pulmonary embolism rule-out criteria. So they cannot have any of these things um, in order to be ruled out for an of pulmonary embolism. So if their age is greater than 50, if their heart rate is tachycardic, if their O2 sat is less than 95%, if they have unilateral leg swelling, they have hemoptysis, recent surgery, prior PE or DVT or hormone use, then they cannot be perked out. So this takes out all of your patients over 50, it takes out anyone that's, uh, that's tachycardic. Um, so it, and really this is meant for very, very low likelihood of having a pulmonary embolism. You don't apply perk to the patient that is a clear cut pulmonary embolism. This is the patient that is a low probability, low possibility. D-dimers. There are um, so many different feelings that people have about D-dimers. Um, let's say you're working in the department and someone in triage put a D-dimer on a patient, you didn't want them to do it and you just get angry that there's a D-dimer on this patient. Um, then there's also the, yes, the D-dimer was negative, I don't have to do a CAT scan on this patient, excitement and joy. Uh, is there any other test in emergency medicine that brings so many feelings to us? I don't know, um, but I know that all of us feel very strongly about D-dimers. The D-dimer should only be used in the patients that you really don't think have pulmonary embolisms. So these are your really low probability pulmonary embolism patients because you don't want to do a CAT scan on this patient. You don't want to expose them to radiation. So you're using the D-dimer to help you and the clinical decision and, and the judgment that you've already made. If the patient has a clear cut pulmonary embolism, they've got a giant leg and they've got a shortness of breath, what is a D-dimer going to do to help you? It's not going to do anything. It's just going to delay care uh, until you get the CAT scan. And same in the same vein, if your pretest probability is high for this patient having a pulmonary embolism, if you get a negative D-dimer, would you not still go ahead and do the CAT scan on that patient? So in that situation, it doesn't help you. Use your clinical judgment and then use the tools to help you make the decision that you are hoping to be able to make it, that your, your gut instinct is telling you. The age adjusted, if you're not using it, start using it. So for every year above the age of 50, you can add 10 points to the cutoff for your D-dimer 
for example, if someone is 55, then their age adjusted would be 550 for the cutoff. If they're 80 years old, their age adjusted would be 800 for the cutoff. The way that they came up with this is actually quite validated and uh, the studies have been great. They initially did it retrospectively and then they tested it prospectively and have had many, many thousands of patients that they've checked it on and it's very safe, so feel free to use it and avoid having to do CAT scans on some of your more elderly patients. The other big group that we usually are scared to diagnose a pulmonary embolism in is the pregnant patient, right? They have a lot of risk factors for having a pulmonary embolism. And so we want tools to be able to hopefully not have to do CAT scans on these patients. So they did the years criteria that's also been validated. And what you can do with the years criteria is if the patient doesn't have any signs of a DVT, and they, you do not think that the pulmonary embolism is the number one diagnosis, and they do not have any hemoptysis, you can actually take the D-dimer cutoff to 1,000. So you can then have less than 1,000, um, all the way up to 1,000 to be able to say that the patient does not have a pulmonary embolism and effectively rule it out. If they have one of those things, then the cutoff goes back to 500. So if the D-dimer is above 500 and they have one of those things, uh, then you really are forced into doing the CAT scan to make sure that you're ruling out the pulmonary embolism. And then if it's less than 500, then you can feel comfortable with sending the patient home and effectively having ruled out pulmonary embolism. So we're going to go into a few cases uh, and see how you can uh, use some of the tools that we've discussed. We have a 52-year-old male that comes in with coronary artery disease, and they have dizziness and shortness of breath with just minimal activity. So CAD, dizzy, short of breath, with just some activity. That's what they're coming in for. The chart, actually, they go through what sounds like risk factors for a pulmonary embolism. The syncope, chest pain, previous DVT, PE, malignancy, recent surgeries, immobilization. None of those are present. And these are actual cases that we've gone through. Vital signs, the heart rate's 91, blood pressure is 121 over 79, respiratory rate's 15, O2 sats 94% on room air. The blood pressure seems a little bit soft to me, just looking in this case, especially with someone with coronary artery disease, I would assume that they have hypertension at baseline, so it seems a little soft. I would assume that they would be on beta blockers, so a heart rate of 91 is also a little bit suspicious to me. Um, and the nurse comes and tells the doc that was on, I put him on O2 because he seemed short of breath moving in the bed. It's a little bit weird. The documented physical exam shows clear lungs bilaterally, regular rate rhythm, heart rate. This is directly taken from the chart. Two plus pulses, all extremities, and the patient is apparently to kip neck. The trope and BNP are both slightly elevated. And so they decide that they're going to start the patient on heparin and admit the patient for an end tummy and CHF. Now, does that make you pause at all? There's, where, where is there chest pain? There was no chest pain. And we can go back and take a look at it. There's no chest pain on this patient. They came in with dizziness and shortness of breath. And maybe they're saying that it is a coronary artery equivalent, I mean, or an ACS equivalent, maybe. Um, and again, this is very much looking back and hindsight is 2020, of course. Um, but th it doesn't seem to make sense. Uh, so end STEMI, there's no chest pain. O2 sats less than 95%. The, kid, the patient is breathless um, and tachypneic. And, and I want you to remember that not all troponins that are elevated, not all BNPs that are elevated equal ACS or CHF. Um, just similar to not all, all that wheezes is asthma, not all elevations in troponins and BNPs are going to be uh, ACS and CHF. So think about it. So what if we went back and applied wells to this patient um, or did a perk on the patient? Would we even get to perk or would the wells be, uh, would it tell us that we shouldn't even do a perk and we should go forward with a doing a D-dimer or we should go over and do a CT on the patient? The other problem is with this case is it seems like they anchored, right? They just said, oh, sweet, CHFs or the BNPs up and the tropes up. This is easy, heparin, go. Have we all been guilty of that? Of course, but this is how we miss things. So, so take that moment, take that step. Does this fit or am I trying to make something fit that doesn't actually fit? So we look back at the case and the O2 sat's 94%. He seems short of breath. His lungs are clear. 
but he's tachypneic, he's documented tachypnea. And if this is CHF and we're putting this patient in for CHF, I would expect maybe some rails on the exam. Um, maybe I, the, the document shows two plus pulses, all extremities, there's no edema. This doesn't seem like a picture of a patient with congestive heart failure. Could they? Sure, have heart failure, of course. Um, but is that really the most likely diagnosis? I don't know, and I don't think so. Um, the other thing here is what could have helped? Maybe an ultrasound, doing a bedside ultrasound might have helped a little echo, show whether there's some heart strain or there isn't heart strain, or maybe look at the lungs and see if it looks like there's some signs of heart failure that you're not auscultating. Um, so that could have potentially helped. Your tools here could help you. So remember that you're a MacGyver and you've got tools and they can help you. The um, patient ended up actually going uh, upstairs on the heparin drip. Uh, two days later, had a CAT scan of the chest showing a saddle pulmonary embolus as well as a right lower extremity DVT. Uh, the patient ended up having thrombolytics and uh, is, was on Eliquis and discharged home from the hospital. Uh, there was a suit brought for delay in diagnosis as the patient does have some uh, residual issues now. Um, so. That's something to think about. So I know a lot of a lot of the times we're like, oh, you know what? Someone will figure it out. But that delay in diagnosis can increase their morbidity of the patient that you're seeing in the emergency department. So it's not always someone else's problem. It's our problem too. And looking back at the chart, I think we could have done better with this. And I want you to be able to do better with this. Cough, dyspnea, chest pain, I want you to think pulmonary embolism. If you get that triad, I want you to think pulmonary embolism. I know you think I'm crazy, especially after what we've all been through with COVID recently. You're like, I'm sick of pulmonary embolism, but I want you to think it because this is what can happen. If you don't think it, you will not diagnose it and you will miss it 100%. This doesn't mean you CTA every patient. It just means you're thinking about it. So you walk into the room, you say, prove to me you're not a pulmonary embolism if they have cough, dyspnea, and chest pain. And ask the questions that you need to ask to risk stratify the patient. And then do your physical exam, touch their legs, listen to their heart, look at their vitals, and see if you can prove to yourself that this is not a pulmonary embolism. And if you can prove it to yourself, great. Document why you don't think this is a pulmonary embolism. And if you still can't take it off your differential, then do the D-dimer or do the CAT scan if they have high enough risk factors once you start thinking about it and are asking the questions. This patient, a 19-year-old college student, went to an ED for chest pain, cough, and dyspnea. What are you thinking? Pulmonary embolism, right? She's given antibiotics for bronchitis, don't get me started on that, um, and told to come back if she gets worse. As a side note, you know not to give antibiotics for bronchitis, right? So she was told to come back and she did. She came back two days later. That's wonderful. We always want our patients to trust us enough to come back to us for their care. She came back in. This time, her vital signs, her heart rate's 107. Her blood pressure is 97 over 65. She was given an inhaler and she was discharged home. There was no blood work done. There were no tests done. There was not an x-ray done. Um, and it doesn't seem like there was really even any consideration for her tachycardia or her blood pressure. She was found dead the next morning. A 19-year-old college student. Because we didn't pay attention to the vital signs and we didn't think pulmonary embolism. So she ended up dead because we treated her for bronchitis when she didn't have bronchitis and we gave her antibiotics. And, and despite her coming back, we didn't pay attention to the vital signs of her telling us that there was something wrong because she's a 19 year old. Was this an anchoring bias? Was this just not thinking it? My thought is we just didn't consider it in this patient. So there's a suit filed and jury verdict for $7 million against the hospital and the ED doc. And looking back, Again, hindsight is 2020, right? Chest pain, cough, dyspnea, heart rate 107, blood pressure 97 or 65. This is slam dunk pulmonary embolism. Remember your physical exam. Examine the legs, vital signs are vital, beware of tachycardia. Whatever you need to do in your daily um, work when you're doing it, maybe you have like a discharge tachycardia or a discharge timeout that you do. You're about to send someone home, look through their vitals. Are they tachycardic still? Is their blood pressure okay? Is this diagnosis really the diagnosis that I'm sending this patient home with? Does it actually fit? And if it does and you don't have any of those abnormalities, 
great, that's wonderful, send the patient home. But if you take that just that like 10 seconds to go back through the chart again before you discharge any patient, you may save a life. This case is a 38 year old gentleman that presented with two days of right sided flank pain. Right sided flank pain, kidney stone all day long, right? Heart rate is 120. Um, there's no chest pain, there's no shortness of breath, there's no cough, no fevers, no syncope, no hematuria. Um, a CT was ordered to rule out renal colic and the UA showed small blood. Okay. The CT instead shows right lower lobe pneumonia and the dispo was home, drink fluids, antibiotics and follow up. Now I want you to pause here for a second and I want you to look through this. Has this happened to you before? Have you gotten a result back on a CAT scan or an x-ray that you didn't expect? And then what do you do with that? Do you then look back and say, does this fit? So I can see how you could rationalize it. Well, they're tachycardic, it's probably the pneumonia, we'll give fluids and we'll antibiotics and the patient is fine. Except you look back at your review systems. There's no shortness of breath. There's no chest pain. There's no cough. There's no fevers. Does this actually fit or are we trying to fit this? Is this right lower lobe pneumonia or is this a pulmonary infarct? Because they can look pretty much the same on CAT scan. So if something doesn't fit, you get a read that just doesn't fit, don't try to force it. Look at it again. Look at the patient again. Why is he so tachycardic? Why is a perfectly healthy 38 year old man sitting at rest with a heart rate of 120. What else could be going on? Exactly. So I want you to think about it. Would, what would you have done? Would you have sent the patient home with pneumonia and antibiotics? Have you before done that? Um, will you do it again? No, you will not do it again. You will decide to take a small second, do a little bit of a discharge timeout and look back at the case and say, this doesn't fit. This doesn't fit. The guy came in looking like a kidney stone. Now I'm diagnosing him with pneumonia. He has no signs of symptoms of a pneumonia. And he's a 38 year old male. He would have some signs and symptoms of a pneumonia. He has nothing. What else could be going on with this patient? What else do I need to look into? The patient returned five days later by EMS. He jumped out of bed and he couldn't breathe. His heart rate was 130, so just a little bit higher than it was the other day. His blood pressure was 89 over 46, and his respiratory rate was 35. And so you think, great, slam dunk, give him TPA, this is a pulmonary embolism all day long, right? No, they thought sepsis. So the sepsis order set was put in, the antibiotics were started, and the patient was sent to the ICU with a CTA to be done en route. So it was maybe there in the background. Um, they thought maybe we'll check and see if it's a, CT if it's a pulmonary embolism. And what do you think happened there? He was diagnosed with a saddle pulmonary embolism. He had right heart strain and he had a right lower lobe infarct and he died the next day. This is a 38 year old man who died the next day because we failed to consider pulmonary embolism. It was not considered on his first visit. It didn't even seem like it was really considered on the second visit. So could we do better? Could we have done better on his first visit to consider a pulmonary embolism? I want you, after listening to this talk, to always consider it in these patients. If it doesn't fit, what else could it be? What else? Go back to your differential and look at your differential and prevent this. The case ended up being settled for seven figures, uh, which is, I mean, it's just awful. Like it, the patient still died. Uh, what happens to the patient's family and what go the clinician goes through after through this type of case? Maybe they turn around and now they order CAT scans on every patient. I don't want that to happen to you. I want you to use your tools. I want you to go back to what you know. I want you to examine the patient. And I always want you to just ask yourself, could it be a pulmonary embolism? And make sure you can answer for you that it's not and you don't think it's a pulmonary embolism. So in summary, use your clinical judgment plus. So use your ultrasound, use your D-dimer appropriately, use your wells, use your perk. And if you, think, if you have a patient that has cough, dyspnea, and chest pain, think PE till proven otherwise, and make sure you prove to yourself that it's not a pulmonary embolism, and remember your physical exam. Vital signs are vital. Don't discharge tachycardic patients without giving them another once over and proving to yourself why they're tachycardic. And don't anchor. I want you to take from this that you're going to look at the patient again and say, this doesn't fit. Why doesn't it fit? Let me give this one more look over and you won't miss a pulmonary embolism. 
thank you for your time. I hope you have a great rest of your day.